Harold Fairhair emerges predominantly in the annals of Norse sagas, with a particular focus on his narrative, found in the Heimskringla saga. However, for a more comprehensive understanding, this video delves into various sagas that contribute additional dimensions to his story, while avoiding conflicting accounts. Beginning with his lineage, the Heimskringla saga narrates that Harald ascended to the throne at a mere age of ten years old, succeeding his father, Halfdan the Black, a monarch of the Vestfold. Both Harald and Halfdan hailed from the House of Ingling, a mythical lineage traced back to the divine realms of the gods. The assertion of divine ancestry was a common practice among rulers, serving not only to legitimise their claims to kingship, but also to fortify their authority in the eyes of their subjects. Harald would have been born in around the year 850. Following the demise of his father, Harald swiftly transformed into a robust, imposing man. In the wake of his father's death, Harald's maternal uncle Guthorm assumed leadership of his army. However, the political landscape was full of unrest as numerous petty kings and jarls defected from central authority, harbouring aspirations of independence. Among the deserters was King Gandalf and the sons of King Aestain, Hogna and Frode. This power vacuum could only mean one thing, war. King Gandalf, having recently brokered peace with Harald's father, Halfdan, sensed an opportune moment for aggression upon his demise, perceiving the Vestfold Kingdom as vulnerable and ripe for conquest. The catalyst for conflict emerged with Gandalf's son, Hake, leading 300 men to march on the Vestfold. Harald would hastily rally an army, assuming command despite his youth. By his side was his uncle, Guthorm, and Harald would have been in his teens when confronted by Hake's forces. This would culminate in a ferocious battle. Harald's metal shone brightly as victory was secured. Hake and the majority of his forces met a grisly end on the battlefield. However, as Harald returned to his realm, an unexpected nemesis emerged, King Gandalf, undeterred by his son's brutal defeat, had arrived in the Vestfold with his own formidable army. Undeterred and resolute, Harald plunged into yet another brutal confrontation. The clash was savage, with a considerable number of King Gandalf's forces succumbing to the merciless sweep of the sword. In the aftermath, King Gandalf, routed and humbled, fled to his kingdom, leaving Harald to assert his prowess as a relentless warrior. Harald, fueled by an insatiable thirst for power, commenced the gruesome groundwork for his unification of Norway by vanquishing five kings in a series of campaigns that would stain the annals of history. In a grisly display of ruthlessness, Harald, alongside his bloodthirsty uncle Guthorm, set ablaze the dwellings of King Aestain's sons, Hogner and Frode. Although the sons narrowly escaped the fiery inferno, their reprieve was short-lived, as Harald's men were waiting outside and quickly cut the princes down. Harald would also ambush the two upland kings at midnight in the Cloak of Darkness. The gory aftermath bore witness to the brutal efficiency in which Harald was killing his opposition. He left no room for mercy. Harald would soon wage war against an old adversary, King Gandalf. The battlefield became a gruesome theatre, with the clash of weapons and the agonised wails of the dying echoing through the night. In the culmination of this blood-soaked saga, King Gandalf, a once formidable ruler, 
succumbed to Harold's onslaught. The spoils of war, including Gandalf's entire kingdom, became the grim testament to Harold's insatiable appetite for conquest. Yet, as the scent of victory lingered, a haunting desire clawed at Harold's psyche, a yearning for the entirety of Norway. This unquenchable thirst was embodied in a woman named Gida, a radiant but defiant daughter of King Eric of Hordeland. Harold, undeterred by Gida's spirited nature, dispatched messengers with the audacious proposition of marriage. Gida, however, proved to be a formidable force herself, rejecting the advances with scorn. Her words, dripping with disdain, echoed through the air, challenging Harold's aspirations. Will no king here make the whole country subject to him in the same way as Gorm the Old did in Denmark? The messengers, perturbed by Gida's audacity, left her residence, dismissing her demands as arrogance. Yet, as they turned to depart, Gida's parting words pierced the air with a chilling resolve. Now tell King Harold these words. I will only agree to be his lawful wife upon the condition that he shall first, for my sake, subject himself to the whole of Norway. The stage was set for a pursuit of power, where the echoes of war and the quest for dominance would completely change the land. When King Harold's messengers returned, they told him what Gida had said. Harold answered, This girl has not spoken or done so much amiss that she should be punished, but rather, she should be thanked for her words. She has reminded me of something which I did not think of before, and now I make a solemn vow that never shall I cut or comb my hair until I have subdued the whole of Norway, or if not, have died in the attempt. King Harold would then orchestrate a gruesome expedition to the uplands, leaving a wake of torment and despair. He commanded that everything be put to the flames. As the inferno of destruction raged on, the anguished cries of common folk filled the air, begging for mercy amid the chaos. Their pleas were met with a sinister bargain. Peace was only offered in exchange for servitude. Their fates were now entwined with the blood-soaked ambitions of a remorseless conqueror. The path of terror carved by Harold encountered no resistance until the ominous battleground of Orkandau emerged. There, a legion had assembled. King Greiting would be leading his army. The ensuing clash transcended mere mortal brutality. Harold would emerge victorious, and King Greiting was taken as a prisoner of war. In the gruesome aftermath, Greiting, broken and defeated, swore fealty to Harold, and the once defiant men of Orkandau now knelt as subjects. Yet, the feral hunger for power only intensified as more kings rallied against Harold. The ensuing battle was a symphony of agony, where kings fell and the vanquished fled, their dominions reduced to ashes. Harold was now responsible for the death of eight kings, reflecting his unstoppable march towards the throne of Norway. To the desolate north, in Naumudal, two brother kings reigned as sovereigns. News of Harold's impending onslaught would shroud these two kings in dread. Facing an abyss of torment, one of them chose the cold embrace of death, buried beneath a collapsing mound by his own men. The other, in a desperate plea for mercy, approached King Harold. A symbolic ritual unfolded, a sword fastened to the king's belt, and a shield would be around his neck. This would mark the end of a regal reign, 
and the birth of a brutal servitude, while defiance led only to the grisly demise by the sword. In the Forge of Winter, Harold commissioned the construction of monstrous longships, vessels destined to glide through the seas and unleash havoc upon many shores. The shipyard would birth many colossal dragon ships, their splendour adorned in the trimmings of grim opulence. In a grotesque display of power, Harold assembled his chosen warriors. These were not mere men, they were the embodiment of brutality, berserkers whose primal ferocity sent shivers through the marrow of even the hardiest souls. Harold would soon march to the land of Moor, ruled by King Huntioth, a ruler whose fate had already been etched in the annals of history. As the clash of steel met the screams of the dying, a great battle ensued. The very earth trembled beneath the weight of the savage combat, and the air resonated with the agonised cries of warriors. Harold, the grim reaper of kings, emerged victorious. The battlefield, a shower of blood, where the fallen lay in grotesque repose. King Huntioff, once a sovereign, now lay dead, his lifeblood mingling with the melting snow. Yet, amidst the carnage, his son Solve Cloth eluded the grasp of death, a lone survivor in a sea of mutilated corpses. Harold's reputation as a regicidal warlord spread like a venomous stain across the land. The whispers of his insatiable appetite for conquest grew louder, and the shadow of his influence loomed even larger. The following spring, King Harold raised a monstrous army in Trondheim. Solve Cloth, the lone survivor from the clash at Solskel, and his vengeful companion, King Arnvid, had spent the winter staining the snow red, their revenge echoing in the anguished cries of Harold's fallen men. Seeking allies in the Fjord district, Solve Cloth, draped in the shadows of vengeance, approached King Aldbjorn. With a voice dripping with the essence of retribution, he declared, It is now clear that we all have but one course, to rise, all as one man against King Harold, for we have strength enough, and fate must decide the victory. To willingly become his servants is no condition for us, who are not less noble than Harold. My father thought it better to fall in battle for his kingdom than to willingly go into Harold's service. King Aldbjorn, swayed by the intoxicating allure of rebellion, pledged his allegiance to solve Cloth's cause. Together, they amassed a formidable army, a coalition born from the shadows of hatred and the yearning for freedom. News of Harold's impending onslaught reached their ears, and the two sides prepared for a naval confrontation. Ships, creaking under the weight of impending doom, were lashed together stem to stem. King Harold's vessel, a behemoth of death, stood poised against King Arnvid's ship, the battleground destined to be the merciless waters. King Harold, a tempest of fury, unleashed carnage upon his adversaries. With a manic rage, he boarded King Arnvid's ship, leaving a trail of death in his wake. Arnvid, meeting his gruesome end, succumbed to the brutality of Harold's wrath. Solve Cloth once again evaded the clutches of death, retreating to live and fight another day. Many of Harold's earls, however, met their demise in the ferocity of this naval inferno, and Solve would rise from the ashes to become a notorious sea king. But Harold's insatiable hunger for dominion pressed on. After the battle, he set his sights on Moor, where King Vemond 
the brother of King Ordbjorn, stood as an obstacle. In a diabolical act of brutality, Harold's Earl Ragnvald surrounded Vemond in a guesthouse and set it ablaze. The crackling flames devoured Vemond and ninety men, their agonizing screams echoing into the abyss. Harold's ruthless grip tightened, and his brutal reputation as a conqueror stained with blood grew even darker. In clandestine meetings with Earl Ragnvald and the fearsome Ulfhednar warriors, Harold plotted his next conquest. These wolf-skinned warriors were his shock troops, his ruthless edge in battle. The Harafsmau whispered of their prowess. They are called wolfskins, who bear bloody shields in combat. They redden spears when they come to war. There at Harold's court, they are seated together. There I believe he the sovereign wise in understanding, may entrust himself to men of courage alone, those who hew into a shield. With these warrior shamans by his side, the rivers of Norway would flow red, and the land would quiver in dread. In the spring, as the ice groaned and cracked, the Gautlanders, in a desperate bid to thwart King Harold's impending doom, drove stakes into the gaunt river. These treacherous stakes, like skeletal fingers clawing at the river's heart, sought to ensnare Harold's ships, a futile defence against a ruthless warlord. Unfazed, Harold navigated his vessels through the labyrinth of stakes. Harold, fueled by an insatiable thirst for destruction, laid waste to the country. Flames licked the heavens, devouring homes and dreams alike. The cries of the vanquished became a symphony to Harold's ears. In retaliation, the Gautlanders, spurred by desperation, descended with a colossal army. This would culminate in the Battle of Hasfajord, where many kings from many different lands came together with a great body of men. The battlefield echoed with a gruesome ballet of ships running into each other, a chaotic dance of death. King Eric was the first to fall, succumbed to the onslaught. Thor Hackland, a berserk of great renown, unleashed his fury upon Harold's vessel, a desperate bid that ended in his own demise, as Harold's Ulfhednar warriors cut down the howling berserker. The battle reached its grisly end, as King Kajopve, in the face of inevitable defeat, fled, leaving behind a landscape marred by the blood of fallen kings, berserkers and earls. Harold, his vow fulfilled, encountered no resistance in Norway, for those who dared oppose him now lay lifeless or bowed in submission. The land, united, quivered in dread as Harold, the blood-soaked architect of his own destiny, stood unchallenged as the king of a united land. King Harold ascended to the throne of Norway, his dominion stretching across the land like an indomitable shadow. In his youth, he was driven by the haunting words of the proud maiden named Gida. Together, they birthed a dynasty. Harold fathered an array of offspring, the sagas, telling us that he had anywhere from 11 to 20 sons, each a testament to his regal prowess. Eric Bloodaxe was his firstborn and heir. As the sole sovereign of Norway, the time for transformation had arrived, submerging into the depths of a bath. Now that Harold was the king of Norway, the time had come. King Harold got into a bath, and Earl Ragnvald would now cut his hair, which had been uncut and uncombed for ten years. Once his hair was cut, all agreed that he had the most beautiful head of hair in the land. Ragnvald, the witness to this metamorphosis, bestowed upon him 
a name befitting his newfound splendour, Harold Fairhair. Harold's rule, an enduring symphony of strength, echoed through the annals of history. His reign endured until the twilight of his eighth decade, an age marked by wisdom and legacy. The torch of leadership passed to his son Eric Bloodaxe. This heralded a new era, a seamless transition from one warrior king to another. The saga of Harold Fairhair, etched in the ink of battle and sacrifice, told of a warmongering conqueror. Over the span of a decade, he bathed the Norwegian landscape in the blood of kings, earls and jarls. A veteran of a hundred battles, Harold, an architect of brutality, seized victory with ruthless efficiency. His methods were unapologetically savage, be it on the battlefield or within the walls of a blazing hall. A champion of martial prowess wove his destiny amidst the clash of steel, never tasting the bitterness of defeat. Harold's ascension was an anthem sung in blood, a saga scripted in battles waged and foes vanquished, as was the life of Viking kings and rulers. A lot of you may know Olaf Haraldsson from the show Vikings Valhalla, but today we will delve into the real life of Olaf, who would die a saint. According to the sources, his life was far more unholy than one would think. At one point, Olaf was a feared pagan and became a warrior in the Baltic region. Over the years, Olaf became a mystical figure and was a hero in folk traditions, where he was the slayer of trolls and giants and the protector against malicious forces. He is even symbolised by the axe in Norway's coat of arms and has his own day of celebration. So how did Olaf Haraldsson become Saint Olaf and what kind of battles and trials would he face? This is his story. According to legend, Olaf was born in Ringerike in Norway in the year 995. His father was Harald Grensk, a petty king in Vestfold in Norway. Icelandic sagas would describe Harald as the great-great-grandchild of Harald Fairhair, the first king of Norway and the unifier of the land. Olaf's father, however, would die when his mother was pregnant with him. After, she would remarry Sigurd Sir, with whom she had other children, including Harald Hardrada, who was his half-younger brother. According to Olaf's saga, once he had reached adulthood, he was of medium height, very sturdily built and physically strong. At just 12 years old, Olaf would go on his first Viking expedition. As the son of a king, he would have been given men and ships to learn the trade of the Viking, which was very loved by his late father, who would have raided across the coasts of the Baltic Sea for years, and fate would lead his son to do the same. Olaf would spend his early teen years with his men raiding towns and villages along the coast of the Baltic Sea. In Denmark, Olaf would meet Thorkel the Tall, the chief of the mercenary group the Joms Vikings, who were regarded as some of the best soldiers in Scandinavia. Thorkel and Olaf would join forces, and together they headed west to England. For three years, Olaf and Thorkel would raid southeast England. In 1011, Olaf would take part in the assault on Canterbury, where King Ethelred the Unready of England had to pay the Vikings, including Olaf and Thorkel, £4,800 of silver to stop the attack. Later, however, Olaf and Thorkel would take Canterbury anyway, capturing the Archbishop, and was said to have burned some of the city. Swain Falkbeard would soon arrive in England. He would storm into London and take the crown from the English king. After just five weeks on the throne though, he would die. King Ethelred would rush back to England from his exile in Normandy and sent word to all those who were willing to help him win back his land. Olaf would come to support the English king and would lead a force of men to help him recapture London from Swain's son Canute. Olaf and his men were successful and Canute was driven out of London with King Ethelred regaining his crown. Olaf then decided to pursue his own ambitions and headed for Normandy 
and decided to offer his services to Duke Richard II of Normandy for a while. According to some sources, he later sailed along the coast of France and Spain, heading for the Mediterranean, raiding towns and villages along the way. According to Olaf's saga, his plan was to sail to Jerusalem. One night, however, Olaf would have a prophetic dream of a man telling him to go back to his ancestral lands, for it was his destiny to be the king of Norway. As a result of this revelation, Olaf and his men would turn back from their voyage and would set sail home to Norway. On the way back, Olaf stopped in Normandy as Duke Richard's guest. During the long winter evenings, an 18-year-old Olaf would hear tales of Charlemagne and how he built his empire and the many battles he had fought. Charlemagne would become Olaf's new hero and role model. In Normandy, Duke Richard and his men often went to mass in the huge cathedral and Olaf would also accompany them. He would be exposed to priests, monks, nuns and bishops. He became convinced that Christianity was the correct religion to follow. In 1015 that winter, Olaf was baptised as a Christian. He then would make his way back to Norway with the intention of becoming its king. He was just 20 years old. When he arrived in Norway, he saw a country divided and ruled by local chieftains and petty kings. He would seek to unite the land, just as his ancestor Harald Fairhair did. Olaf started out in his home in Ringerike, where his stepfather helped him become accepted as king. Not long after, he would be acknowledged as king in all southeastern Norway. After the death of Olaf Tryggvason, Norway had been divided into a Swedish part and a Danish part. The rest of the country was under the control of the local kings and earls. Soon enough, Olaf would find himself in a battle. Swain Hakonson was ruling the Swedish part of Norway and had learned that Olaf was rallying support in eastern Norway. Once Olaf had gathered his forces, he would begin his trip northwards to confront Swain. On the 25th of March 1016, their fleets would clash, resulting in the Battle of Nesjar. Few accounts of the battle have survived, however it's generally regarded that the battle was fierce with a lot of casualties. None of the major players were killed, however Swain Hakonson was chased off, relinquishing his grip on power and retreated to Sweden, making the road easier for Olaf to unite Norway. Olaf then annihilated the petty kings of the south, subdued the aristocracy and conducted a successful raid in Denmark. Olaf would then begin negotiations with the king of Sweden and married his daughter Astrid. After subduing the south, Olaf sailed to Halogaland and was accepted as king. At just 22 years of age, Olaf was king of all Norway. This was a transitional period for Norway, with many of its people turning away from their pagan beliefs of old and turning to a new god. Along the coast, many people were Christian, but inland in the countryside, people still worshipped the old Norse gods. Olaf's role model and idol was Charlemagne, and like him, Olaf would let his sword pave way for the cross. In 1024, Christianity was accepted as the official faith in Norway, with the old Norse gods fading from this world. Olaf would make Christian law the law of the land, which would become very unpopular to many, especially the ruling class. Canute the Great, now the ruler of Denmark and England, would soon set his eyes towards Norway and wanted to add the country to his empire. Canute would bribe Olaf's nobles and promise to grant them their old way of life if they accepted him as king. They would gladly accept, and in 1028, Canute would arrive in Norway with a large fleet. He was accepted by the earls and chieftains as king. Olaf would flee the country and went to Novgorod in Russia to the court of King Yaroslav where he stayed for two years. King Canute had his base in England and went back there to rule his North Sea Empire. He left an earl in charge of Norway, but in 1029 he would die, and his first wife, El Gifu, would go on to govern the country. Once Olaf had heard of the earl's death, he would make his way home at the head of an army. Olaf was supported by the Swedish king Anud Jacob, 
who wanted to weaken Canute's power, and provided Olaf with 400 men and guides that would lead Olaf through Sweden to Norway. According to saga sources, Olaf travelled with 3,600 men through Sweden and crossed the mountains into a valley north of the city of Trondheim. Olaf and his men would soon arrive at Stickelstad, and Olaf would go into battle with his gilded helmet and his white shield with a holy cross painted on it in red. The battle was described as bloody, with many men falling from both sides, and so in the year 1030, the Battle of Stickelstad would take place. King Olaf would fight alongside his best men who carried his banner. He fought in the front lines, and is even described in the sagas as stepping forward out of the shield wall into the vanguard and would engage the enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Olaf is recorded to have wounded and killed many soldiers, but in the heat of battle, Olaf would receive an axe wound to the knee, causing him to lean against a stone. Another man would then thrust through his belly with a spear, and finally, a sword came his way. This blow landed on the left side of his neck, and there at the Battle of Stickelstad, Olaf died. The Battle of Stickelstad is one of the most celebrated battles in ancient Norse history. The aura of legend that surrounded Olaf's death, and the heroic and quite brutal way that he died, plus his work for the church, led to his canonization in 1031. His popularity would increase when he died, with many churches and shrines being built in his honour. Rumours about strange miracles taking place in the area where Olaf was buried started spreading like wildfire, and he quickly became Norway's patron saint, and many would travel from all over the Norse world in order to visit his shrine. With the death of Harald Hardrada in 1066, everyone thought that the Viking Age was coming to an end. The dragon-headed longships that used to inspire fear all over Europe would no longer be seen in the distance, and the seaborne raiders were soon becoming nothing but a memory. Magnus Olafsson was of the same stock as his legendary grandfather Harald Hardrada, and instead of moving on with the rest of Europe, he would look back to the glorious days of old, and would crave war and battle. This is his story. Magnus was born around the end of 1073, and was the only son of King Olaf. His father was known as King Olaf the Peaceful, perhaps traumatised by the death in battle of his own father Harald Hardrada. He made sure to have a good relationship with other nations, by strengthening the crown's relationship with the church. Magnus grew up in Nidaros, the medieval capital of Norway. However, as per Viking tradition, Magnus would be fostered by his father's cousin, the chieftain Tore Ingerdson. His influence explains how Magnus became the man he was always destined to be. Magnus was described as a handsome youth. He was also extremely clever. When King Olaf the Peaceful died, his son Magnus was declared the king of all Norway but many people in the uplands chose Hakon Magnusson, his cousin. Norway had experienced a long period of peace during the reign of King Olaf, but that would soon come to an end. Hakon would claim half of Magnus's kingdom, and he was even crowned in the uplands, an ancient land of forests to the north of Norway. Hakon was even elected to be King of Norway at the Thing, where it was tradition for the kings of Norway to be proclaimed. This was symbolic, as Harald Fairhair, the first king of all Norway, was hailed at this particular assembly, where chieftains from each district gather, so Hakon had many symbols of legitimacy, which would strengthen his claim. The people even wrote a ballad about him, young Hakon was the Norseman's pride, and Steg Thorer was on his side. Young Hakon from the upland came, with royal birth and blood and name. Young Hakon from the king demands, his royal birthright, half the lands. Magnus will not the kingdom break, the whole or nothing he will take. Upon hearing of this, King Magnus would make his way north. When his cousin King Hakon heard that Magnus was coming, instead of preparing for war, 
he would greet him with hospitality, and would offer his cousin gifts. However, Magnus was ill-pleased with these great gifts, as he thought that much of what he was given was already his own property. This irritated his mind, and he thought he had suffered a great injustice and disrespect. In his mind, he would have less income than his father and predecessors, which played on his mind. Magnus, however, didn't want to kill his own cousin, nor be known as a kinslayer. Unexpectedly, Hakon would die while hunting, after reportedly falling ill, but Magnus's fears of other men contesting the throne were not over. Something to note is that Tor Tordson, also known as Steig Torer, was instrumental in influencing a young Hakon to press his claim on the throne, and he would continue doing this as he didn't recognise the kinship of Magnus for some reason. A new claimant for the throne would come forward, a man named Swain Haraldson, described as a great Viking champion, would gain support in the uplands, being the alleged son of Harald Hardrada. And guess who was in his ear? It was no other than Tor Tordson, one of the last influential Viking chieftains, who held enough power to influence or demolish royal dynasties, or at least try to. Egil Asgelson would also join the rebellion, and he was one of the richest and most powerful men in Norway. Swain would soon crush the royal fleet led by one of Magnus's nobles, and he then seized Tondelag. Magnus would rush to meet Swain, and soon enough the two armies would meet on the field of battle. Magnus's forces would triumph, and the treacherous chieftains would be captured. Tor Tordson and Egil Asgelson were both tried for treason and were found guilty. King Magnus would witness their executions as they were led to the gallows. Magnus was in such a rage that none of his men were so bold as to ask mercy for them, and there they died by hanging. Their deaths would not sate Magnus's rage though, and he would sail to Tondelag and burned much of the region as they had revolted and turned against him. It's unclear what Magnus's ultimate ambitions were, but once he had secured his own kingdom, perhaps he was simply unfulfilled and didn't wish to have a peaceful administrative rule like his father Olaf. So, he turned to the sword. Historians have speculated that he wanted to capture the throne of William II of England, just like his grandfather Harold Hardrada, and that he wanted complete control of the Irish Sea. Magnus sailed into the Western Sea in 1098, arriving in Orkney, which are a group of northern isles in Scotland. After his arrival, Magnus began negotiations with Scottish and Irish kings about control of their lands. After negotiations went sour, he began raiding Scotland and pillaged many villages. He even captured the Isle of Man, and it would become his base for a time. During his time there, he built several forts, implying he had subdued the region. He also brought the local chieftains to heel, and made them recognise him as their king. Bjorn Krephend wrote a ballad about Magnus' early wars. On Sandy's plain, our shield they spy. From Isla smoke rose heaven high. Whirling up from the flashing blaze, the king's men are were the island rays. South of Cantire, the people fled, scared by our swords, in blood dyed red, and our brave champion onward goes, to meet in man, the Norseman's foes. Afterwards, King Magnus would sail to Wales, but as he approached the shore, the Normans who had just captured Angsley from the Welsh, did not allow Magnus to land his ships. They would begin shooting arrows at the Norsemen, while they were still aboard their ships, and the Normans were there on the shore. Earl Hugh the Red was clad in armour, and seemed almost impenetrable, but Magnus drew his bow and shot his arrow, which landed directly in Hugh's visor, penetrating his eye, and he died instantly. Earl Hugh would fall, and the Normans would flee having lost many men. Magnus was usually in the forefront of the fighting, and craved battle, eventually earning the name Strife Lover. 
another song was sang about this particular battle. On the panzers, arrows rattle, where our Norse king stands in battle. From the helmets, bloodstreams flow, where our Norse king draws his bow. His bowstring twangs, its biting hail, rattles against ring-linked mail. Up in the land, in deadly strife, our Norse king took Earl Hugh's life. After the battle, King Magnus took Anglesey Isle, but he soon turned back with his fleet and went to Scotland, leaving the Norman army weak and demoralised, where he and King Malcolm of Scotland made an agreement. All the islands lying west of Scotland would belong to Magnus. That winter, he would fortify the islands, making sure the garrisons there were loyal to him. He then returned to Norway a year later in 1099, now having the islands to the west of Scotland under his control. Once Magnus returned to Norway, his attention would now be to the east. He would seek to claim an ancient border between Norway and Sweden. However, the Swedish king, Ing the Elder, would refute the claim, and in response, Magnus Strifelover would call his army and would begin another campaign. In 1099, Magnus would raid and pillage his way through the disputed lands, while King Ing amassed his own army. It is said that Magnus rode up from Viken with a great fine army, and when he came to the forest settlements, he plundered and burned all round, which caused the people to submit and swear fealty to him. He would then garrison his men in a nearby island and made a stronghold of turf and wood and dug a ditch around it. King Magnus then left 300 men there to defend the land and returned to Viken. Soon enough though, the King of Sweden would ride out with his men once the ice had frozen over, and by the strength of many hands, the newly constructed walls of the fort were broken down. The King of Sweden would spare Magnus's men, but ordered them to retreat without weapons or cloaks, and as each of them fled, they received a stroke with a whip. Magnus would once again make preparations for his war, and he would reconquer some areas of Sweden. Eventually, there would be a pitched battle with both kings present. In the end, the field was covered with Swedish corpses, and Magnus would gain the victory, but the king of Sweden managed to escape. The following summer, the Danish king Erik Evergood was concerned that this conflict would escalate into one monarch overcoming the other, and if that happened, they would expand their power, and then his own kingdom would be in danger. So he would encourage peace talks between the two kings. The three kings, Magnus, Ing, and Eric, would meet at the Gult River, and they managed to come to terms and establish a peace. King Magnus would marry King Ing's daughter Margaret, and with this peace offering, the greatest of enemies became friends and family. After just over a year, Magnus was growing bored with peace, and once again, he set his course west. In 1102, he amassed an army and made his way to Ireland. He would stop off at the Scottish island of Orkney for reinforcements. Tensions were high between King Magnus and the High King of Ireland, Munster, who also had a rival king called Donal. But Magnus would secure a peace agreement with one of the kings by marrying his son Sigurd to the High King's daughter. On the wedding day, Magnus named Sigurd his co-king and put him in charge of the western islands in Scotland and all western lands he had conquered. Around the same time, the High King Munster married the daughter of Arnulf Montgomery, the brother of Hugh, whom Magnus had slain with an arrow to the eye. Munster was skilled in diplomacy, and he knew how to play the political game. Nevertheless, Munster and Magnus would go raiding together after their peace agreement, and would seek out their rival Donal. With Magnus's power being at an all-time high, it may have been in the High King Munster's interest to kill him, as this would further improve his relationships with the Normans. King Magnus would intend to return to Norway to see the affairs of his own kingdom. In the morning, as the sun rose, King Magnus went to the shore himself, 
with the greater part of his men, and they saw a great dust rising up in the distance, as if there were several horsemen on the move. King Magnus put on his helmet, and drew his famed sword called Legbite, of which the hilt was of ivory, and the hand grip was wound with a gold thread. All men acknowledged they had never seen such a warlike king in their lifetime. As the dust cloud approached, they realised it was their men who were bringing cattle for slaughter for the long journey ahead, and so Magnus and his army would relax, and would prepare for their voyage. This was a mistake. The Irish emerged from their hiding places, and ambushed Magnus' forces. Magnus managed to assert control over his men, who were not prepared and were barely armed. He ordered archery fire to slow the advance of the Irish, but as they got closer, melee combat would ensue. In the battle, Magnus was pierced by a spear through both of his thighs, and was driven to his knees. Then an axe-wielding Irishman charged at him, and struck him in the neck, and that was his death wound. The king was avenged by one of his men who killed the axeman, and took the king's sword and banner back to his ship, even though he was gravely wounded in a last act of honour. Throughout King Magnus's campaigns he always said, Kings are made for honour, not long life. He was the last Norwegian king to fall in battle abroad, and is largely known to history as the last Viking. Magnus's legacy survives in song. He has become the subject of at least two Gaelic ballads, and scores of Norse ones. Many a time has the name Magnus been sang in the taverns of old. Magnus is also commonly known as Barefoot, as he was once forced to flee from a Swedish attack in his bare feet, but I think the name Strife Lover fits him far better. In modern times, a beer has even been named after his sword, Legbiter. And so after the death of Magnus, the Viking Age truly came to an end. The First Crusade had one objective, and that was the recovery of the Holy Land from Islamic rule. Members of high-ranking nobility and their men would arrive at Constantinople between November and April in the year 1097, with an army estimated to have been 100,000 strong. The Crusaders would win several battles, and eventually would capture the city of Jerusalem in 1099. The first king of the newly established Crusader state of Jerusalem, King Baldwin I, spent a lot of his life campaigning against various independent cities that spanned across the coastline. The region along the eastern Mediterranean shores, corresponding to modern-day Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria, is the Levant, and it was home to many rich and ancient fortresses, most of which were still occupied by non-Crusader forces, and ruled by the Egyptian Fatimids. Over ten years after the First Crusade in the year 1110, the people of Akka would see dragon-headed longships on the horizon, gliding through the waters, and leading them was King Sigurd of Norway, who led what is known to history as the Norwegian Crusade, which was an aftermath of the First Crusade. Many armies had tried to emulate the First Crusade, but all failed, being repelled by the armies of Asia Minor in the mainland. But like Sigurd's Viking forefathers, he used ancient routes, sailing around Europe like Bjorn Ironside did in his own raid to the Mediterranean. The Norwegian Crusade marks the first time a European king personally went to the Holy Land. King Sigurd was already a battle-hardened veteran, having spent a lot of his teen years fighting in Ireland and the Scottish Isles with his father Magnus Strifelover. Even being named the King of the Isles, which consisted of the Isle of Man and the Hebrides, Sigurd would eventually take the fight to the Middle East, sparking the Norwegian Crusade. But who was Sigurd the Crusader? This is his story. Sigurd was born around the year 1090 in Norway. His father Magnus, also known to history as Magnus Strifelover, or the last Viking, would always be at war. In 1098, when Sigurd was around eight years old, he accompanied his father on an expedition to the Orkney Islands, the Hebrides, and the Irish Sea, being given his first taste of war. He was made the Earl of Orkney the following year, Magnus's conquest of the Isles was the first time that kingdom had been under the direct rule of a Norwegian king. In the year 1102, Magnus would set his course for Ireland, 
Magnus's plan was for conquest, but he ended up agreeing to a peace agreement with the High King of Ireland, with a marriage agreement with his son Sigurd and the High King's daughter. On their wedding day, Magnus named Sigurd as his co-king and put him in charge of the Western lands. The High King recognised Magnus' control over Dublin and other Irish counties. However, during a campaign in 1103 to expand his lands in Ireland, King Magnus was ambushed and killed. The teenage Sigurd would abandon his wife and sailed back to Norway where he and his brothers were declared the joint kings and co-rulers of the Kingdom of Norway. Sigurd would rule the kingdom jointly with his brothers Oystein and Olaf for some time. This was very rare, as the brothers weren't fighting amongst themselves and squabbling over the throne. This relationship between the brothers ushered a period of peace in Norway that would later be remembered as a golden age. The expeditions conducted by Magnus and Sigurd were profitable to the kingdom, and many islands under Norway would provide it with much wealth and trade, allowing the land to grow rich. By 1107, Norway's treasury was filled to the brim, and Sigurd and his brothers had heard tales of the Crusades, and the great warriors fighting in the name of God to solidify the Crusader states. All of the brothers wanted to go. At first, there was a debate as to who should lead the Crusade. It was decided that Sigurd should go, as he was the brother with the most experience with war and travel. So in 1107, the Norwegian Crusade was declared, and Sigurd became the first Christian king to embark on this holy mission. He was not even 20 years old. King Sigurd and his warriors were the descendants of Vikings. Venturing across the seas and marauding was in their blood. This crusade would be much like an old time Viking raid, with one main difference. This time, Sigurd and his men were going to worship the holiest Christian shrine of them all the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. The journey would be a long and perilous one though. Sigurd and his men would depart from Norway in 1107 with around 60 ships and 5,000 men. He would arrive in England in the autumn, where Henry I was king. King Sigurd and his men were treated extremely well and would stay in Henry's court until after winter. In the spring of 1108, the Norsemen would set sail south. After several months at sea, they came to the town of Santiago de Compostela in northwestern Spain. Sigurd and his men had the permission from a local lord to stay for the winter. However, when winter came, there was a shortage of food, which caused the local lord to refuse or sell food and any other goods to the Norsemen. Due to this, Sigurd now enraged, gathered his army and attacked the lord's castle and plundered it for all its wealth. Sigurd would soon find himself in another battle, where he and his warriors besieged a castle called Sintre in Spain. It was said to be occupied by many heathens, and King Sigurd would make quick work taking the castle. He then proceeded to kill every single man inside that refused to be baptised. The Skald Haldor describes the battle. From Spain I have much news to tell, of what our generous king befell, and first he roots the Viking crew, at Sintra next, the heathen slew, the men he treated as God's foes, who dared the true faith to oppose, no man he spared who would not take, the Christian faith for Jesus' sake. Sigurd and his men would continue sailing along the coast of Portugal, they encountered a fleet of pirates, naturally, King Sigurd attacked them. King Sigurd would annihilate the pirates with his battle-hardened force of warriors, who let's not forget, fought alongside his father in many campaigns. Eight ships were captured and were added to Sigurd's fleet. After this, the Norsemen continued to Lisbon, which was said to be half Christian and a half heathen city, as it was divided between Muslims and Christians. There in Lisbon, King Sigurd would have again his third battle which he won. His path to the Holy Land wasn't easy and was filled with strife but he would amass much wealth and glory along the way. A description of Sigurd's crusade wasn't pretty. In the Hemskrimla saga, it states, King Sigurd sailed westwards along heathen Spain and brought up at a town called Alcace, and here he had his fourth battle with the heathens. He took the town 
and killed so many people, the town was left empty. This song by the Skald Haldor portrays the savagery of the Norwegian crusade. I heard that through the town he went, and heathen widows wild lament, resounded in empty halls, for every townsman flies or falls. The year is now 1109, and it's two years into Sigurd's crusade. After entering the Mediterranean Sea, the Norsemen sailed along the coast of the land and made their way to the Balearic Islands. These islands at the time were perceived to be nothing more than a pirate haven and slaving center. They first fell on the island of Formentera, where they encountered many Saracens who had hidden in a cave, and built a stone wall before the cave's entrance. Sigurd was a clever man, and he had his men bring large trees to the entrance of the cave, and made a pile of wood in the mouth of it. He then set fire to the wood, which set the cave on fire, and the resulting blaze and smoke choked and burned many of the Saracens who hid inside. The group of pirate Saracens were sitting on a hoard of wealth though, and once they were killed, Sigurd got his hands on the greatest treasure that he would ever acquire. Thereafter, King Sigurd proceeded to successfully attack the islands of Ibiza and Menorca, and the Norsemen were again victorious. The Skald Haldor describes Sigurd's victories. On green Menorca's plains, the eighth battle now he gains. Again the heathen foe falls at the Norse king's blow. In the summer of the year 1110, King Sigurd sailed across the Greek sea and arrived at the port of Acre. From there, he and his northmen made their way to Jerusalem, where they met the ruling crusader king Baldwin I. King Baldwin received Sigurd very well and rode with him all the way to the River Jordan, and then back to Jerusalem. The Norsemen were also given many holy relics, and treasures that were fabled to the Vikings. However, King Baldwin would soon ask King Sigurd for help himself, in capturing Muslim ports along the coast. In 1110, Baldwin's army would besiege the city of Sidon by land, while the Norsemen surrounded it by the sea. King Sigurd was instrumental in the battle, as the Fatimid had a fleet at Tyre. The city, however, would fall after 47 days. The Skald Haldor gives the following account. He who for wolves provides the feast, seized on the city in the east, the heathen nest and honour drew, and gold to give from those he slew. When the city surrendered, King Baldwin gave a splinter off the true cross that Jesus had died on to Sigurd, as a token of friendship, and as a relic for his heroic participation in the Crusades. Thereafter, King Sigurd returned to his ships, and prepared to leave the Holy Land. On the way home from the Holy Land was the great city of Constantinople. King Sigurd and his Norsemen hadn't lost a single battle in their crusade, and were welcomed to the city as heroes, and they rode into the city with great splendour. Sigurd would stay in Constantinople for some time. Before he left the city, he gave the Emperor Alexios all of his ships and much of his wealth. The Emperor in return gave the King many horses and guides to see him to Norway safely through the land instead of the sea. As King Sigurd left Constantinople, many of his men would remain and would become part of the Emperor's bodyguard in an elite group called the Varangian Guard. King Sigurd then travelled through Bulgaria, Hungary, Serbia and Bavaria where he met Emperor Lothar II of the Holy Roman Empire. He later arrived in Denmark where King Nicholas accompanied him north to Jutland and gave him a ship where he could finally return to Norway. King Sigurd was joyfully welcomed back to his kingdom in the year 1111. It was common talk among the people that none had made such an honourable journey from Norway as King Sigurd had. He was just 17 when he left for the Norwegian Crusade, and on his return he was still young, at 21 years old. King Sigurd returned to a prosperous kingdom, and he wouldn't idle after all his adventure, he would build a castle in Konghel, which he made his capital, 
Sigurd was still restless, and eventually in 1123, over 10 years after his return to Norway, he would go on another crusade, but this time, it was to Christianize the region of Småland, a historic province in southern Sweden that had remained openly pagan, with its inhabitants still openly worshipping Norse gods. King Sigurd decided that he had to force Christianity on the pagans of Småland. In 1123, he gathered his army and would set out to steal pagan lands in the name of the church. It is said that Sigurd assembled 300 ships, which would soon be gliding across the water, and the men on them were eager to plunder and kill for their god. Warfare between the Crusaders and the still heathen men of Småland on the Isle of Åland would take place. The Norwegian Crusader army would completely annihilate the opposing pagans and would force them to submit to the Christian faith. Sigurd would bring back 1,500 cattle and many valuables. In the year 1130, Sigurd would die and was buried in Halvard's church in Oslo. King Sigurd had been king for around 27 years, from the year 1103 to 1130, and was 40 years old when he died. The time of his reign was good for the country, for King Sigurd had never lost a single battle. His co-king brothers had governed a prosperous country, while Sigurd would be out forging his legacy of battle, and would be nicknamed Sigurd the Crusader. And apart from Sigurd's two crusades, there was peace. I hope you enjoyed hearing about the life of this legendary king and about the Norwegian crusade. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to like, subscribe and share, and I'll see you all soon for another History Profile.